I have to admit that that gospel lesson we just heard has me feeling a little sheepish. Two Sundays ago, I was challenging you to answer for yourselves Jesus' biggest question, who do you say that I am, and then be ready to go out of here as disciples. Now, here he is, already muddying the water, saying some completely outrageous things that make you wonder whether he is seriously disturbed or just having a really bad day. The disciple John comes running up to Jesus, clearly upset, declaring, we saw this uncredentialed, unknown healer doing spectacular things, and what's worse, he wasn't using your name at all. We tried to stop him but couldn't. He's not even one of us. Who does he think he is? And Jesus responds in this laid-back, easygoing manner. Oh, leave him alone. It's not really doing any harm, is it? Maybe it might even be doing some good. Who knows? Whoever's not against us is for us. Just let it happen. Anyone who does the simplest act of mercy is for us. How laid back can you get? This is Jesus, the warm, affirming, open-minded Savior, Mr. Unconditional Love the one who welcomes little children and anyone who comes his way. But then Jesus wheels around and glares at his disciples saying, as for you, anyone who causes even one of the least in our community to stumble, it would be better for you if you were thrown to the bottom of the sea. And he's just getting going. He goes ahead, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Your foot, cut it off, and if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. Better that than to, than to be thrown into the hell of fire and worms. Hmm. What happened to our warm, welcoming Lord, ready with His arms wide open to embrace us? Of course, crowds were used to hearing traveling preachers using over-the-top images like cutting and gouging to grab their attention. And this does sound like a lot of Hebrew exaggeration, but Jesus is saying something important. I advise you, in this case, not to take him literally today. Do not go gouging at the end of the day. But still, it seems harsh and cruel any way you look at it. Preacher Will Williman at Duke University remembers the time someone came out of the chapel one Sunday morning and said, I know you would never want to hurt anyone in one of your sermons, but I was hurt by your comment that, and Williman tells us what he immediately thought for himself. Where on earth, she, he, he was thinking and said, did you get the notion that we wouldn't want to hurt you here? This is Jesus we're dealing with. It's going to get a little rough from time to time. Well, today is one of those rough patches. But what if, for all of Jesus' exaggeration, he is actually right? What if he is not threatening those disciples, but actually loving them and us, and is refusing to make his way sound easier than it is? He's saying that we're caught in patterns of living that keep us from growing into the fully alive human beings we're meant to be. And it stems from our attachments to behaviors and images of ourselves that are imprisoning us. Jesus wants the disciples to know clearly what it costs to follow him, how wrong turns can hinder them, and how they can find their way to li- and how they can find their way to lives of centeredness and faithfulness if they will just persist. If all this sounds overly dramatic, then maybe we've lost track of what following him can mean. It's about a lot more than being kind and friendly and comfortable. It's about allowing God to draw us into lives of depth and breadth 
and love and compassion and living a free new way through our days. Today, Jesus is pointing to some of the dangers we human beings face simply in trying to follow him. Dangers that come from the choices we make, the unhealthy patterns that claim us, the ways we wake up and realize that our lives aren't what we had hoped they would be. In a type A culture such as this one, the fiercest attachments that can claim us are often success, popularity, comfort, achievement, security, companionship, power. Of course, all of those, all of those can be goods in themselves. The danger is that we become attached to them and end up living lives that become less and less free, more anxious, more driven, and often more frustrating. Psychiatrist Gerald May wrote a few years ago a fine book called Addiction and Grace, in which he says that it is in the nature of every human being to become attached, and he would say, addicted, psychologically dependent on some dimension, some relationship, some engagement. And often those are good things, relationships or professional achievement or popularity, but those very goods themselves can subtly become the gods that shape our lives. Gerald may even list his own personal attachments. I was, he says, addicted to work, performance, responsibility, intimacy, being liked, helping others, and an almost endless list of other behaviors. However much intimacy or approval I received, I always wanted more. In all of Jesus' harsh language, I think he is saying that really living God's love means seeking freedom from the attachments that bind and hold us back, that keep us self-absorbed and living lives less than we were made for. And of course, being released from our fears, our secret selfishnesses, our quietly earnest efforts to secure our lives is never easy. Gerald May says that only a power from beyond us, God's grace, God's love poured into us, can actually release us from our bonds. We need the gift of God's liberating love, which is one of the very first reasons that we keep coming back here to the Eucharist to be fed by that love week by week. If our hand or foot or eye or any inner attachment is keeping us from the aliveness we're made for, we need to detach, to let go, to, by the grace of God, claim our freedom. No one said this is easy. When the pilot group, Trinity's senior staff, were having our weekly Bible study with this passage this week, One of us recalled a riveting movie from several years ago called 127 Hours, based on a true story. It's the story of a climber in the Utah canyons who slips and falls and ends with his arm trapped between a boulder and the mountain wall, making it it impossible for him to move. Hour by hour, day by day, he was pinned there. And finally, he had to decide if he was willing to cut off his arm in order to live. I'll skip the details, but he did just that, survived, and is still climbing in those canyons to this day. Sometimes we have to cut off or break away from what it is that's binding us. It can be painful, but there can be immense life on the other side. 
Jesus is challenging his disciples to name what is keeping them from fully following him. But what about us? What are we clinging to? Is it our busyness, our helter-skelter pace, our need to be highly successful and greatly liked? Is it our fear, our sense of inadequacy, or a wound from the past? What might we have to let go of to have deeper lives, real relationships, time for those we care about, and working lives that don't drain the last ounce of energy from us? Some of you may remember C.S. Lewis's great parable of heaven and hell called The Great Divorce. In it, anyone who wishes is welcome to go to heaven and stay there as long as they wish. But many new arrivals find the light too bright, the truth of the conversations too demanding, and the call to love and be loved impossible. They quickly begin to reveal their own attachments, jealousy, resentfulness, grieving, and they're determined to hold on to them no matter what. One man encounters an acquaintance from his life back there on earth, a man he had hated all that time and was so outraged to see him in heaven that he refused to stay there and went right back to the lower realm where he wanted to be. An arrogant English bishop is furious that no one is giving him the attention he thinks he deserves. A woman has been grieving the loss of her son for years and refuses to let go of it to find a new life. A skeptic is determined not to trust anyone or anything, and so sadly many of the travelers to heaven decide they would rather hold on to their attachments that give their lives meaning and go back to the lower realm. To open, rather than do, they would rather do that than to open themselves to the freedom of living in God's love. One more word. It isn't only for us as individuals who need, we are not the only ones who need to let go of the things we cling to. The words from Pope Francis these last few days have been charged with the call to loosen our grip on our attachments. The things we cling to as a nation, our wealth and power, our hard-heartedness towards the plight of those who are most vulnerable, our greedy destruction of the earth. In his gentle, warm, beseeching way, he pleaded with us Americans and with the world to look at each other as children of God, to cast our eyes and hearts especially toward the poorest and most vulnerable. Let go, he was pleading, of your prideful consumption that leaves so few living in great wealth and so many billions of God's children hardly surviving. Let go of your blindness to the struggles and the needs of the poor. Let go of your desecration of this sacred earth. It is your attachments, Pope Francis was saying, that are doing such terrible damage to God's beloved world. Let them go. Jesus has given us a hard, provocative lesson today. Unbind yourself from your attachments. Allow Christ's love to come in and set you free and find the joy and freedom so many saw in the face of Pope Francis. It's a peace that the world cannot give. And that peace is on offer today and every day.